Hi, I'm Victoria Farrow, and I'd like to talk with you today about the continuing relationship between gardens, plants, and quilts. I've been a quilter for many years and have recently become especially involved with gardening through the Kentucky Cooperative Extension Master Gardener Program. As you can see from the detail shots of quilts across the top of your screen, plants abound in quilts, and quilters are masters at using them in creative ways. In this presentation, we'll take a look at the different ways a quilter might depict a plant in a quilt, and then look at samples of quilts featuring specific plants and their flowers. Whenever possible, there's also an image of the flower for reference. I'll give you time to enjoy the images on each slide, but remember that at any point in this video, you can hit the pause button to spend more time enjoying a quilt. In art, we often depict what we know. These Hmong story quilts, or story claws made in Laos, are filled with plants, gardening, and harvesting vegetables and grains because their makers live in a largely agrarian society. The images are embroidered with thread onto the fabric background. Usually they only have two layers, the embroidered top and a backing fabric, so they are often called claws rather than quilts because technically a quilt has three layers, a top, a filler, or batting, and a backing, though there are exceptions like the crazy quilts. Inspiration is all around us. In the top left photo, it is easy to see why we often speak of a patchwork of fields. The crazy quilt below is amazingly similar. There are even rows of embroidery stitches edging the quilt's fabric fields. Produce neatly displayed in containers is not unlike the images contained in quilt blocks. The beautifully cultivated rows of a field are very similar to the rows of squares stretching diagonally across Bargello-style quilts. Historically, flower gardens have especially inspired quilts. At the top of your screen is a detail of a very large quilt by Danny Amazonas, a Taiwanese quilter whose work I recently saw on display at the National Quilt Museum in Paducah, Kentucky. A former floral designer and mosaic artist, Mr. Amazonas has developed a very unique way of working with fabrics. Cutting the fabrics, fusing them together, and then machine stitching them in place using invisible thread. This technique allows him to create very complex color combinations and shadings. On the right is a small photograph of Mr. Amazonas working on this particular piece. As you can see, it is quite large. I thought it was absolutely stunning. In my research, I discovered that not only do gardens inspire quilts, but quilts and quilting also inspire gardens. There are gardens in many states based on quilt designs and an especially large number in Indiana, where there seems to have been a concerted effort to create quilt-inspired gardens in public spaces, a little like the quilt barn movement that started in Ohio and has spread to Kentucky and other states. The gardens you see include the very popular Dresden plate block in the lower left with a walkway through its center. Also depicted are a basket pattern, a pinwheel, and other designs. I find these gardens truly amazing, and I can't imagine the planning and work that went into making them a reality. Many quilters are also gardeners. Ginny Beyer, a professional quilter whose books inspired me to try new ways of working with traditional quilt patterns in the 1980s, is also an avid gardener. Ms. Beyer wrote and published a number of books sharing her approaches to quilting, she taught workshops nationally and was one of the first quilters hired by a fabric company to design fabrics specifically for quilters. On the left is a view of one of the quilt block inspired areas of her garden and a piece of garden ironwork that is also based on a block pattern. On the right is a fabric she designed for RJR Fabrics. To me, the fabric seems clearly made by someone who has spent much time in a garden. The complexity of the colors and shadings are very like those of plants viewed in dappled light. Her gardening and fabric work seem to inspire and affect each other. And that connection between gardening and quilting makes great sense. Both making quilts and creating gardens involve working with color, texture, shape, and repetition
to create pleasing compositions. Focal points are developed, symmetry or interesting asymmetry are created, and colors and textures star. Both quilt making and gardening also involve the use of paths, which are called sashing and borders in quilts. Garden walkways contain or line beds, and quilt sashing contains blocks. Walkways lead from one area of a garden to another, connecting and creating a cohesion. Sashing and borders make a quilt a cohesive whole. Gardening and quilt making, even very specifically, often involve the arrangement of flowers at some point. Just as gardeners select and arrange the flowers from their gardens in unique ways, quilt makers have their own ways of creating bouquets and fabric and stitchery. Some can be highly realistic and others impressionistic. One of my favorite similarities between gardening and quilt making is that both can be accomplished very effectively using just simple tools and materials. There are wonderful resources available for each endeavor, but in truth one can garden with just seeds, a trowel, soil, and water, and one can quilt with just a needle, thread, scissors, a filler, and fabric. And if necessary, the fabric can be worn out clothing or scraps, and the filler can be the blanket that needs replacing. And these activities are also similar in that they both require patience, and both are often passed from one generation to the next. They have another important similarity. They both offer an opportunity for creativity. I think that's why even the most utilitarian of vegetable gardens often includes a small patch of flowers, or at least an ordering of plants that brings beauty to the garden. And a patchwork quilt clearly made out of entirely scraps or used clothing will often show evidence of attention to making the combination of patches attractive. The anonymous quilter who stitched this quilt has organized the hexagon pieces to create flowers. In fact, so many quilters organize them that way that by the 20th century this had become a quilt pattern known as Grandmother's Flower Garden. For many quilters, a bed quilt, even when it's made for warmth, becomes a canvas for creativity. The Ohio, Ohio quilter who made this 1940s quilt has again used the hexagon shape we just saw. She uses it to create flowers around the outer border, with plain hexagons in between to isolate the blooms. What I love about this quilt, though, is the way that the maker went on to depict her home and its drive, flower beds, and even clouds, all in hexagons. And when quilters had the resources and skills, bed quilts were turned into showpieces of great beauty, for guest beds, for presentation gifts, or for entry into fairs or shows. This is one of the many stunning quilts in Kentucky Museum collections. In addition to the plants depicted in fabric pieces, note the additional plants depicted in the quilting, the stitching that was done through the top, filler, and backing fabric in the white areas of this quilt. This masterpiece is, be is beautiful viewed from a distance and then offers additional surprises when viewed up close where you can enjoy all the stitching. Such artistry and mastery of techniques continues today. This is a floral quilt made by contemporary quilt makers and is in the collection of the National Quilt Museum. The detail shows beautiful quilting and a bloom made using a technique called ruching, which involves gathering fabric to create a three-dimensional flower. This technique was very popular during the 19th century and continues to be used very effectively today. Beautiful floral quilts are being made around the world. This is an example of a masterpiece created in Japan that was displayed at an international quilt show in Houston, Texas. Kentuckians are very fortunate to have the American Quilter Society's annual international show held each year in their own state, in Paducah, where over 400 quilts from all over the world are displayed. And we also have the National Quilt Museum, which displays quilts year-round and whose collection features many extraordinary quilts. Quilts inspired by gardens are not just bed size. 
In recent years, many quilters have been creating smaller wall hangings, like this quilt, Curb Appeal, which depicts nine homes in their gardens. Included are many familiar landscape plantings. This particular quilt is shown with the first prize ribbon it won for its category at one of the American Quilter Society's other shows. Depictions of gardens can also be abstract or impressionistic like this one. A variety of print fabrics have been combined to suggest that complex mix of colors and patterning one finds in gardens. Looking at the quilt, you feel this is a person who has spent much time enjoying gardens. The connections between gardening and quilting are endless. These are just a few of the many quilt books that recognize and further that connection. I love the subtitle for Quilter's Patch, which says, Grow Your Quilt Garden, Block by Block. Before looking at more examples, I thought it might be helpful to look at how a quilter might work with an inspiring flower, like the iris. The older I become, the more I seem to enjoy my old and new-fashioned bearded irises. One way to bring the iris to a quilt would be to select a fabric depicting the flower. There are many beautiful fabrics available today with all sorts of images, including flowers such as the iris, some quite realistic and others less so. All dramatic, though. Including large floral images in fabric is nothing new. Across the top of the screen are 18th and 19th century chintz fabrics that clearly represented specific blooms. I was lucky to find examples of some of my favorite flowers, the iris, the cone flower, the bleeding heart, and the blackberry lily. These fabrics initially imported from India were especially popular for quilts in the late 18th and 19th centuries. Quilters would often cut out the specific images and stitch them to a background. The technique was called rotary purse. This is an example of an 1830s rotary purse crib quilt. The swags of blooms were cut from a chintz fabric and sewn on top of the off-white background, as were the leaves and bouquets around the edges. The chintzes could be very expensive, so using them in this way was often a way to reduce expense. The images could be spread out on the background so less yardage was needed. The workmanship in this quilt is so good that it can be difficult to comprehend that the flowers were applied to the background. Another special type of applique can be used to depict an iris, Hawaiian style applique. For this, two fabrics are used, one to create the design, in this case an iris, and the other for the background, in this case an off-white. The design is created the way that, as children, those of us who grew up in snow country, cut snowflakes out of paper by folding a sheet multiple times, cutting a design, and then opening out the paper. In the upper left is the pattern. The purple fabric has been folded in half, and then in half again, and the design cut and opened. The middle photograph shows the design before raw edges have been turned under. The right photograph shows the quilt with the edges turned under and appliqued. You can see that turning the edges under creates space between the parts of the design. Lily Kama was considered a national treasure by the Hawaii's Polynesian Cultural Center for her Hawaiian quilting. In these photos, she is cutting, appliqued, and quilting her breadfruit block using the techniques I just mentioned. I'm going to show a few examples of her work because I think it is very interesting the way Hawaiian designs approach working with plants. Her breadfruit block looks much like the view when you look up at the tree, though she flattens everything so even the fruit jut out sideways between the leaves. That tendency to sort of squash the parts is in part necessary because the center must have a large solid area to stabilize the continuous applique design. Here are three more of Kama's quilt designs. At first, I couldn't figure out what the shapes between the leaves of the Swiss cheese plant were, and then it occurred to me that they must be a bloom that I'd never seen. I found a photograph and that confirmed it was in fact the bloom. The torch ginger is tipped on its side, as are the water lilies. It's a fascinating way to depict flowers, 
Entire Hawaiian quilts are made using the same approach with one continuous design on top. To get back to our iris, traditional applique uses a combination of separate pieces applied to a background. You're looking at a number of examples of quilts made using a very popular 1930s applique pattern developed for Mountain Mist Quilt Batting Company. To promote their batting, the company put patterns on their wrappers and many people use them. I find this design, which includes only the iris's standards, falls, and sheaths, clearly depicts an iris. As you can see, quilters connected their applique iris blocks in different ways to create a quilt. Some quilters add the beard or the signal patch to their depictions of the iris, either through applique pieces or through embroidery, whether they're making a traditional pattern or designing something original. One of the most exciting things about quilting is that each individual quilter, even if they're using a traditional block, tends to make that block his or her own. Other quilters use raw edge applique, where they do not turn the edges under, but rather fuse and stitch down the pieces, which allows for more realistic ruffling and other small details. Some use hand-dyed fabrics, which bring color variations that add to their depictions of the iris. Thread work often enhances quilts, adding complexity. On the left is the front of Belinda Beulah's iris, and on the right is the back, showing the stitching that goes through all the layers. I flopped the photograph so you can more easily see the relationship between the applique pieces and the stitching over them. Sometimes quilters stitch in colors that match the fabric, and other times they use contrasting color thread for effect. Each quilter brings his or her own vision and style to the depiction. When I first saw this iris quilt by Jane Sassaman, I have to admit it took me a minute to recognize that it was in fact an iris. But the more I looked at it, the more I realized how remarkable the handling is. The beard, which can be a startling contrast in reality, truly is a focal point here because of its size and the intense color. The wonderfully ruffled standards and falls are strikingly depicted in different print and solid fabrics. Sassaman is another artist who has also designed fabrics. We'll look at both a few of her fabrics and some other quilts later on. Using a printed image and using applique are not the only ways a quilter can depict a flower. Geometric pieces have long been used to depict designs, the simplest being the square. On the left, I have pixelated a photo of an iris into squares only. If a quilter wanted to use that many squares, the iris could be reproduced in that way. I say many squares because when the squares are small, it is possible to create the illusion of the standards and falls being rounded, even though you're using squares. I was reminded of this while looking at the work of Chinese artist Ai Weiwei at a museum. Weiwei has depicted zodiac animals in Legos. The finished pieces are about five feet square. Seen from a distance, as in the center photograph, the chin, nose, and teeth look curved. But when you look at the piece up close, you can see that those areas are really jagged. They have to be because it's made entirely of small square Legos. But from a distance, the illusion is of a curve. If a quilter adds triangles to the squares, the squares can be even larger and still maintain the illusion of curves. That is at the heart of many traditional quilt patterns. For ease of construction, the goal with a traditional piece or geometric design is to be able to make it with all straight seams joining the individual pieces. A pattern like this iris can be broken down into squares and triangles making squares, which can be stitched together in a straight line. That way the blocks can be stitched in strips and then the strips stitched together. The triangles and squares can be colored in different ways. This pattern was developed by Ruby McKim, a 1940s designer whose patterns were syndicated in papers and also published in her book 101 Patchwork Patterns, which is still in print today. It is a book I used a great deal when starting to quilt in the 1980s. 
I fell in love with this iris pattern and made it and the pansy below it. She also developed the applique iris pattern shown, but I always felt her piece designs were her best. There were a number of women who designed and collected patterns in the first part of the 20th century and were very successful businesswomen. Ruby McKim's piece design is often colored in such a way that yellow triangles suggest the beard seen from the front in the middle pe petal and from the side on the other petals. Here are some examples of typical renditions in fabric. I'm never sure exactly why quilters color in the center as they do, but regardless it remains clearly an iris. It's important to remember that once a quilt block design is printed or shared, especially without colors being indicated, the quilter who makes it is free to interpret the geometric pattern in any manner. What began as a pattern developed from the actual flower may be handled by someone who simply sees it as a design to be handled visually. I'm not sure why different colored fabrics are used for the left-hand standards and centers in this quilt, but the total effect is fun and does convey the chaos of a garden of mixed colored iris in full bloom, and I love the addition of what I believe are swallows. And many quilts involve a combination of techniques brought together by the particular quilter and his or her unique vision and abilities. These are just a few of the many beautiful iris quilts being made. Let's now take a look at some quilts inspired by other plants. This is by no means a comprehensive look at what is being done in today's quilt making. It is a look at a range of examples I'm aware of. It was actually very hard to select just this number. I have a whole folder filled with quilts that I wanted to include, but that would make the presentation too long. Hope you enjoy what follows. This oriental poppy pattern is another favorite Ruby McKim pattern. I love the way it looks when the blocks are set solid, meaning set without sashing or plain blocks between the poppy blocks as they are in the diagram you're looking at. It is an example of a block that is mainly geometric piece shapes, but also has applique used for the stems and leaves. I love the stylized block, but never especially thought of it as a great representation of a poppy until I looked at photographs of poppies and realized that a pair of petals really do hang lower when you look at the bloom head on. So it actually is quite representative. This is another variety of poppy depicted in a quilt by Ruth McDowell. I mentioned that many quilters are gardeners and McDowell is a great example. She's a quilter whose work really influenced my quilt making. It was in viewing a piece of hers that I came to realize that large print fabrics could be used to add texture and line in a piece design. The striped fabric she uses in the center of these Iceland poppies and for the petals beautifully capture the flower's qualities and the large print poppy fabric used in the border gives a real sense of these blooms being amidst a bed of blooms. This is another variety of poppy, the California poppy, beautifully depicted by Carol Morrissey, entirely in applique, using solid color fabrics. I love the way each quilter approaches flowers in a different way. This is another quilt by Carol Morrissey, created using applique but in a very different style. This is one of several quilts she has made using only applique circles. The title is Six Roses, and if you look at it from a distance, you can see six stems leading to rosebuds. The image is closely cropped, so you don't see the full buds. In antique quilts, we often find roses appliqued, often in wreaths, like in this 19th century Kentucky quilt in the collection of the Speed Art Museum. Probably the most common traditional quilt patterns with rose in their name are appliqued rose of Sharon patterns. There are many variations of this pattern, and many beautiful quilts have been made with it in the past and today.
Lilies are another flower that often appear in quilts, sometimes in a generic way, and at others as very specific types. The Canada lily is a lily I was introduced to through a quilt, this quilt by Ruth McDowell. I love the way she uses entirely piecing to capture even something as small as the stamen's red anthers. On the left is an applique Canada lily pattern developed by Nancy Cabot for the Chicago Tribune in the 1930s. Cabot was another very successful p pattern designer. Like McDowell, she has included characteristic features like the whorls of leaves and flower heads nodding downward. The lily's three petals and three sepals, collectively called tepals, curve back, but not all the way to the stem, just as they do in life. On the left is one of several popular traditional quilt blocks depicting a lily. It is called Carolina, or sometimes North Carolina lily, and may have been inspired by the Carolina lily, but it seems more likely that Carolina is associated with this particular lily block because of where it was made. Whatever its origin, there are many very beautiful Carolina lily quilts, like the one shown here in detail. The common daylily appears in many quilts. I have always liked this quilt by Jane Blair called Grandmother's Lily Garden, which is in the collection of the National Quilt Museum. I enjoy how effectively she has captured both individual blooms and the way an established lily bed looks using only straight line piecing. Here are two more quilters depictions of the day lily. Charlotte Hickman has used applique and much stitching on the surface to capture the complex colors and chaos of a lily bed. Ruth McDowell has captured in fabric the contrasting colored mid-rib running down each tepal and the color in the throat at the center. She also uses a printed fabric that almost looks three-dimensional to add the slight ruffling that often appears along the edges of the tepals. She creates the chaos of leaves so often in the background of a garden through the use of striped fabrics. Asiatic lilies are also found in quilts. This quilt made by a Japanese couple depicts their family all together in a garden of lilies. Using fused raw edge applique stitched with invisible thread, these quilt makers have beautifully captured the vibrant colors of the spotted blossoms, the fleshy stems, and the blade-like leaves of the Asiatic lily. Spring and spring flowers inspire many quilts. This quilt features trillium, crocus, fritillaria, and grape hyacinths. When I first saw the quilt, I immediately recognized everything except the fritillaria. The only blooms I was familiar with that were that size and had pendant or nodding bell-shaped flowers were snowdrops, which are white. But a friend posted a photograph of a fritillaria in bloom, and I realized that that's what they were. The fabric Schwartzman has selected for them are perfect for recreating the tessellating patterns these blooms can display. This is another spring-inspired quilt by Jane Sassaman, whose iris we saw earlier. The quilt features bloodroot, trillium, jack-in-the-pulpit, and emerging plant shoots, all beautif beautifully colored and in Sassaman's unique style. These photos give you a sense of how Sassaman creates a quilt like this. Individual elements like bloodroot leaves and flowers are assembled, and she then puts sections of the quilt together. The composition is very complicated with many elements overlapping each other. The jack and the pulpits are suggested by spirals, like the white pattern piece positioned in her design area. And once again, this is the completed quilt, a jumble of spring blooms with new plants shooting up in the lower left and upper right corners. Here are several more of Sassaman's quilts. Just as in her earlier iris quilt she made the beard a focal point, she draws one's eye immediately to the dramatically veined petals in her Johnny Jump Ups. In the Columbine quilt, she has turned the curving spurs or modified petals of the flower into dramatic spirals and captured the brilliant contrasting yellow of the anthers. <laughs>
I mentioned earlier that Sassaman also designs fabrics. Here are fabrics she has designed based on the Bleeding Heart, the Jack in the Pulpit, the Dandelion Leaf, the Primrose, and Field Clover. Each is a fascinating treatment of the particular plant. Terry Kramser is inspired not just by spring, but by plants she finds in a specific place, her walks along the Mid-Atlantic Appalachian Trail. These are two quilts she has made depicting the May apple or wild mandrake plant. She has beautifully captured its twin umbrella-like leaves and solitary flowers. Note the background, which is entirely squares with a second small square in the center. The result is a complexity of color and pattern like that we find in nature. These are two other quilts by Kramser. The left-hand quilt depicting bloodroot was likely also inspired by her walks along the Appalachian Trail. She has nicely captured the lobed basal leaves, thick stems, and many petaled white flowers. The quilt on the right depicts the American ghost orchid, a plant I learned about because of her quilt. This rare flower is native to Florida and Cuba, and is sometimes also called a frog flower. Both the quilt and the plant are quite remarkable. Another quilter who is inspired by nature is Pat Durbin, who uses a range of techniques to recreate the woodlands. In this quilt, she has used machine piecing, raw edge applique, machine quilting, and images cut from commercially printed fabrics. In the left detail, notice the way Durbin has cut printed plants and appliqued them on. Also note in the right detail how in other areas she has created branches of leaves using solid fabrics, adding even a hole in one leaf. Notice the various fabrics combined to recreate the tree trunks. Machine stitching ties it all together. This particular quilt is in the collection of the National Quilt Museum. Trees, and especially their leaves, have inspired many quilts. On the left are renderings of several traditional pieced maple leaf blocks, many of which appear to be based on the sugar maple. On the right is a contemporary quilt based very specifically on the Oregon maple. Note that Lisa Jenny has included prints of additional leaves and a seed cluster in the background. It looks as though she might have actually printed the background fabric using real leaves and seeds and then enhanced the details. A number of quilters do use actual leaves to print images on their quilts. The National Quilt Museum has a quilt entitled titled Hammered at Home by Iris Acock. As you can see, Acock has used a large single empress tree leaf at the center, surrounded by sweet gum leaves. She has next added a border with kiwi leaves in the corners and ferns that I believe are sword ferns. Around the outside, she has printed tulip poplar leaves and more kiwi plant leaves. This technique, often called Cherokee leaf pounding, involves taping a leaf to fabric, turning the combined pieces over fabric side up, and literally pounding with a hammer to drive the color from the leaf into the quilt. Acock then used fabric pens to add details to the leaves and hand dyed the solid borders. Even weeds can be inspiring for a quilter. I have to say that personally I find the dandelion a pretty spectacular plant myself. Kate Thiemel approaches quilting in a very painterly way, building up the image with fabric and then adding stitching for detail. She has used wonderful stitching to depict the magnificent seed head that drives people crazy. Joanne Webb has focused on the striking lobed leaves of the dandelion, depicting the plant's basal rosette at the center of her quilt. Carol Breyer Fowler Gentry, who lived in Paducah, Kentucky for a number of years and has recently moved to Oregon, has created an entire quilt focusing on the dandelion. She printed digital photographs of actual dandelions on plain fabric to create custom fabrics for the pieces in her quilt. This is an unusual approach for Fowler Gentry. Her quilts are often organic, not depicting specific plants, but very plant-like. 
She is most known for her extraordinary machine quilting. The photo shows her working on a quilt. A quilt of hers won the coveted Best of Show Award at the American Quilter Society International Show in Paducah in 1989. It was the first machine quilted quilt to win a significant international award. There were many objections at the time, but machine quilting has since become an art in itself, and there are now entire categories for it in large quilt shows. This is another quilt in which Fallert Gentry celebrated what many would dismiss as a weed. Her use of color and line bring wonderful drama to the dried seed pods of the buttonweed, a common plant in the mallow family. The sunflower is another plant that appears in many quilts. These are two examples of patterns shown in 1940s quilts. The left-hand quilt is appliqued and features the disc-like flowers growing from the edges of the quilt. The piece quilt on the right also includes applique for the stem and leaves. The flower heads droop as they often do in life. Sunflower leaves are usually much more finely serrated but these leaves work well in the design. Sue Benner has completed a series of quilts featuring the sunflower head in all states of its growth. She uses fabrics and thread to make the heads equally exciting whether the flower is in full bloom, fading, or almost at its life's end. I mentioned earlier that a Ruth McDowell's quilt had introduced me to Canada lilies. I also first saw Hobblebush Viburnum and Miner's Lettuce in these quilts. Her Viburnum quilt makes me want to find the plant for my fall garden. She has expertly captured the variegated colors in this plant's fall leaves by piecing together different fabrics and using plaids. Miner's Lettuce is called that because this semi-succulent plant native to California, was eaten by miners during the gold rush to prevent scurvy. The stem actually passes through the leaf and a tiny white or pink flower grows on top of the leaves. McDowell has stitched small buttons to the center of the leaves to suggest the flowers. I have also learned about some tropical plants through their depictions in quilts. Ruth DeVos, an Australian quilter, has been inspired by native plants, including Grevillea, an evergreen flowering plant with a flower that is actually petalless. The flower is a calyx tube that splits into lobes, called tepal lobes, that curl toward the stem and have anthers at the end. Attached at the base are long, thin styles with pollen presenters at the end. The styles can be so fine and numerous, in some varieties, that the plant is sometimes called the toothbrush plant. All these parts are captured in, in DeVos's quilt. She has also depicted the Banksia, a wildflower in Australia. A Banksia spike contains a multitude of flowers, shown as a spike that is not yet mature. In the detail you can see how the style loops back. As the plant matures, the styles flip out, starting at the bottom of the spike. DeVos has represented the multicolored styles with strips of fabric and quiltings to suggest texture. I have found that eucalyptus leaves and flowers are often depicted by Australian quilters. I think DeVos has used applique very effectively to capture both the leaves and blossoms in these two small quilts. This is another Australian quilter's depiction of the eucalyptus blooms. Deborah Worsu captured a, a specific variety of eucalyptus, Silver Princess. She has used hand-painted fabric and stitchery to capture the bloom's pink stamens. Her embroidered French knots work perfectly for the yellow anthers on their tips. Stitchery is the primary technique used by Barbara Himes to capture another favorite flower, the hollyhock. I've always found the erect stalk and large blooms and button-like buds fascinating from the time I first saw them growing along the side of my grandparents' garage. And Shipper Vermeeren, 
a quilter from the Netherlands, uses small hexagons to depict hollyhocks in her quilt. The shape works especially well for the fascinating buds. This is Velda Newman's interpretation of hollyhocks. She has beautifully captured a profusion of the very flamboyant blooms. Newman is known for creating close-up views of plants in very large quilts. The scale is hard to recognize in a photo with no reference point, so let's move to another quilt. In the photo, Newman is standing in front of her zinnia quilt, which it took her two years to complete. This quilt, which is more than 17 and a half feet wide and over seven feet tall, is based on Newman's study of a wide variety of zinnias that she grew in her backyard. She photographed the zinnias when they started blooming and continued until they were done. Each flower in the quilt was composed of many petals cut out of fabric, assembled into the flower shape, and then stitched together. The lavender dots scattered across the surface of the quilt represent grains of floating pollen. Newman focused on the foxglove in this quilt, which is 5 feet by 11 and a half feet. The blooms are created using hand-dyed fabrics, paint, inks, and the quilt is then hand-stitched and hand-quilted. A profusion of pendulous wisteria are captured in this quilt by quilter and shipper Vermeeren, the Netherlands quilter whose hollyhock quilt we looked at earlier. Here again she's using tiny hexagons to capture the blooms. Peonies appear in printed fabrics and in quilts. This is a second floral quilt of Danny Amazonas I saw at the National Quilt Museum during his exhibit. I've included a detail to show better the way he uses a multitude of fabric pieces to effectively capture the mass of stamens at the blossom center. We'll look quickly at just a few of the other plants depicted in quilts. Here's a parrot tulip by Llewellyn Morgenthaler. Camellias are the subject of this quilt by Melinda Beulah. I've included a detail that shows the way she has used a combination of fabric and stitching to capture the blossom and its dense, brilliant yellow stamens and the glossy leaves. Fuchsia is captured in this quilt, which was painted and then quilted. It is an amazing piece included in the permanent collection of the National Quilt Museum. I'll next show you a close-up so you can enjoy details of the stitching. It's quilted using free motion machine quilting, which means the quilter is guiding the fabric under the needle of a sewing machine throughout the process. It may sound easy, but it definitely is not. One of the things I love about art is that it often helps you see qualities that you might otherwise miss. I really love the effects of plaid used in the petals on this quilt. I've grown Coreopsis for years and have seen some with two-tone banded petals, so I initially thought it might be Coreopsis, but the proportions of the bands didn't seem quite right. I then found this blanket flower quilt by Carol Morrissey and realized that the flowers in Ruth McDowell's quilt were in fact a blanket flower. I had grown blanket flowers last year but never really focused on the forked nature of the petals until I saw them made a focal point in this quilt. The quilt is very different in its approach but also beautifully captures the blanket flower. With help from another quilter, I was able to identify the flower in this quilt. It seems appropriate to finish the presentation with a winter bloom, the witch hazel, which here in Kentucky blooms in February. Not only has Ruth McDowell captured the very unusual blossoms of this tree, but she has also beautifully set it against what looks like a winter scene. Once again, she has done that through using just commercially printed fabrics, piece together.
I hope you've enjoyed Quilter's interpretations of a range of plants and that you agree that what is being created is very exciting. It is my hope that plants continue to inspire quilts for a very long time.